Okay, so atrial septation, again, I, I kept saying mechanisms are important, but again, we also don't want to get too lost in the weeds here because that's that's easy to do. So let's just look at this process. I remember things, as you guys know, I remember things in threes, okay, in threes. So I have to break this down into three simple steps. Step one, the septum primum forms. This is going to represent my atria up here, okay? So we're not really looking at, you know, any other structures. The ventricles would be down here, right? We're just looking at the atria. So I have my right atrium, I have my left atrium, and then I have this endocardial cushion here, which remember is responsible for forming the interventricular septum as well as some of the valves, okay? So the septum primum is the first thing that forms, and we can see that over here. So the septum primum is going to move from the roof of the atria here, and it's gonna move inferiorly. Now the space that's between the septum primum and the rest of the atria down here, this is gonna be the foramen primum. Now, sometimes it's the term foramen. Sometimes the other term that can be used here is ostium. Okay, so foramen, ostium, they're really kind of talking about the same thing. It's an opening, essentially. Okay, and so again, it's an opening between the septum primum and the atrioventricular cushions. So this is, again, all of these kind of terms you have to be familiar with. They could say endocardial cushion. They could say atrioventricular cushion. They're really talking about the same thing. Okay, so that's the first step. Pretty straightforward. We're going to have this septum primum come down. Remember, primum, I think of primary, I think of one, right? So these are the first structures that form. Then in step two, we have the second structures that form. We have the foramen secundum, which essentially comes from resorption of this membrane. So there's a hole that is basically forms in this membrane, and that's occurring as this septum primum eventually kind of moves inferiorly, okay? And it reaches the, the endocardial cushion here, as you can see. So that's the foramen secundum. Again, can also be called the ostium secundum. The septum secundum is actually going to be this structure here. Now, the, the difference with the septum secundum, remember with the septum primum, it was one structure that moved inferiorly. With the septum secundum, just like the name says, right? Secundum, second, two, there's two parts to it. There's a part, I'm gonna highlight it here, that's gonna come down just like the septum primum from the roof, and then there's a part that's gonna come from the septum primum and the endocardial cushion, kind of in between the two, coming this way, okay? So this is, again, a gross over, oversimplification. I hope you don't hold me to any of these things, but the concept is just kind of knowing what these structures are doing because sometimes questions on this can come up, okay? So the septum secundum is going to come from two segments, okay? So se segment one coming down, segment two coming up, and eventually, when the septum secundum is kind of closing in here and we have this opening that is from the foramen secundum or the ostium secundum, blood can move from one atria to another. Now I know in utero, I'm not gonna get into all the details, the blood should be moving from right to left, okay? So I'm not gonna get into all the technicalities on that in this video. That's what we have the physiology videos for. Um, but I just want to kind of give you a general idea of what's happening here. And if this remains open, which it does in a, a large portion of the population, actually almost a quarter of the population, then we would call it a patent foramen ovale. Okay, and so that's what the patent foramen ovale is. Now again, normally what happens is this is gonna close. So you might be saying, okay, well, how does it close? How do we get to this step where this all kind of closes up and we have an atrial septum between the right and left atrium? How does that happen? When the baby is delivered, we clamp the umbilical cord, the baby starts breathing, right? When I clamp the umbilical cord and the baby starts breathing in oxygen, my pulmonary vascular resistance will decrease. Okay, so think about that. Why is it gonna decrease? Well, it's gonna decrease because remember, the, the pulmonary vessels they constrict when there's hypoxia. Remember, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. Hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. That's very important to remember because it's kind of unique in some sense to the pulmonary vessels. When there's deoxygenation, my pulmonary resistance goes up. Now, when the baby starts breathing, right, spontaneously breathing, I'm getting oxygen in there. I'm gonna open those vessels up, decrease pulmonary vascular resistance. When I do that, right, the left atrial pressure is gonna go up because more blood is now flowing through the pulmonary vessels, taking that blood to the left atrium and out of the right side of the heart. So the right pressures will drop, the left pressures will increase. When the left pressures increase, what's gonna happen is I'm going to push these left pressures against this septum and I'm gonna force this thing shut. Okay, so that's the concept.
Now the reverse is true. If I do something to increase the right atrial pressure, then I'm gonna push blood this way. And instead of closing this thing shut, I'm actually gonna open it. Okay, so if I have a patent foramen ovale and I increase right atrial pressures, right, then I'm going to push blood through or open my, pain, my foramen ovale and push blood from right to left. But normally what happens is if I have an increase in left side of pressures, that will eventually close the foramen ovale. But like I said, in some people, it doesn't completely shut. And so they're said to have a pain foramen ovale, which opens up when I increase this right atrial pressure, forcing uh, blood from the right side to the left. Whatever side has the higher pressure, blood's gonna leave that side, right? And so that's kind of the, the general concept there. So this happens again because there's incomplete joining of the septum primum and septum secundum. And again, those two structures are the septum primum and the septum secundum. They're fusing together. If they don't join together, that would be a patent foramen ovale. Most patients that have this, again, asymptomatic. Where this comes up in board questions, they're gonna give you a question about a pregnant woman or a woman that has a smoking history and oral contraceptives or someone with factor V Leiden deficiency, uh, hereditary thrombophilia. These are the patients that are gonna come up in a board question because they're at risk for clots. And normally, normally what would happen is if I have a patient Let's say I have a patient that has a DVT. We're gonna simplify things. So here's a vein in the leg. Let's say I have a patient that has a clot here, okay? So we're just gonna call this a DVT. So I have a patient that has a DVT or a venous thromboembolism. What will normally happen is this thromboembolism can go up through the inferior vena cava, right? So here's my IVC, my inferior vena cava. So the clot can go up through there and then it can go into the right atrium. Okay, so it can go to the right atrium and then it can go through the um, tricuspid valve to the right ventricle, and then it can go to the pulmonary artery, right? And then it can get lodged here in the pulmonary vessels, but it's not going to get past the pulmonary vessels. There's usually not enough room. When it gets to the lungs, what do we call that? We call that a pulmonary embolism or a PE. So that's why we know a DVT can go on to form a PE, okay? However, it can get past the lungs if we have some kind of shunt that will push the clot from the right side to the left. That's called a paradoxical embolism because you wouldn't expect this clot to get to the left side of the heart, okay? We wouldn't expect it to get there. The only way it can get there is if there was an opening somewhere in the right atrium potentially that can get that clot through to the left atrium. And the other thing is, the right atrial pressure has to be higher than the left atrial pressure to make that happen. So what you wanna remember for paradoxical embolism is we're talking about usually a DVT that can go from the venous circulation over to the left side of the heart. And then what happens when we have an embolism on the left side of the heart? Think about AFib, atrial fibrillation. It can get ejected up from the left ventricle into the aorta up to the brain or to the renal arteries, okay? So you can have a stroke from that. And so that's where you have this cerebrovascular accident that's sometimes said to be cryptogenic. In real life, you know, cryptogenic is just saying we don't really know what the cause was. In board questions, cryptogenic, associate that with paradoxical emboli and number one i would say is going to be the pain and foramen ovale a uh, far number two would be an atrial septal defect now what's the difference between an atrial septal defect which i'll talk about in more detail in the shunts video but what's the difference between that and a pain and foramen ovale so an atrial septal defect is a persistent shunt between the right and left atrium whereas the pain and foramen ovale you have basically like a flap here and when i increase the right atrial pressures i can open up that flap. Okay, so it's opening and closing intermittently, but that's the general concept. Now, if, if you're saying, okay, in a board question, how do I differentiate the two? Atrial septal defects will classically have a wide, and this is particularly high yield, a wide fixed split S2. We'll talk about this much more coming up, but I'm just kind of introducing it. There's a couple different mechanisms for atrial septal defects. The big one is the um, secundum type of atrial septal defect. The septum secundum basically doesn't get far enough down, and so we end up with a persistent shunt here. But just remember that the secundum type is the most common, it tends to be isolated in general if it's the secundum type. There is also a premium type not particularly high yield, just kind of including it here for completeness. But you can also see cryptogenic strokes, paradoxical emboli with atrial septal defects. 
but it's not nearly as classic as you would see with a PFO. I also included on here that the ventricular septal defect most commonly occurs to defects in the membranous portion of the interventricular septum. Okay, again, mechanisms are the big deal here, so I want you to also remember the specific locations where these are happening. Again, incomplete joining of the septum primum and secundum for the PFO, for the ASD, for the secundum type, typically there'll be insufficient growth of the septum secundum. You can say aplasia or hypoplasia of the septum secundum. And um, there are, like I said, some other ones, but that's really the big thing I would remember for atrial septal defects. And then ventricular septal defects, remember, it's typically due to defects in the membranous portion of the interventricular septum.